Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon everybody. So I'm going to talk about the eco-assessment of uh, PFO and atrial septal aneurysm. So those are my objectives. And there is a guideline for that, uh, which is published by the American Society of ECHO. And as my colleague Dr. Bassam mentioned, you know, in order to understand a PFO, we have to understand what's the function of PFO and how it's developed. But to make it short, you need to understand that there is a thick membrane, which is uh, uh, the septum secundum, and a thin membrane that, you know, uh, have a flap-like uh, mechanism and valve mechanism that is needed during embryology, embryological life to shift the blood from uh, left, uh, sorry, from right to the left. Uh, but which is no longer needed in uh, adult or after birth. So what should we assess? It's not only PFO that we should assess. When we are assessing PFO, mainly for a stroke, uh, we should assess a PFO, atrial septal aneurysm, stachium valve, Chiari network, because all contribute to the stroke. So again, as I just mentioned, PFO is found in quarter of the population. However, it's found in 40% of people with cryptogenic stroke, so it, is, it has a role in, uh, in stroke. Atrial uh, septal aneurysm is defined as excursion from septal plane of uh, more than 10 millimeter uh, or a combined total excursion, left and right, of 15 and more millimeter. So why atrial septal aneurysm is important? Because it is associated with the presence of PFO but not only any PFO, but a large size PFO, and of course, increased incidence of embolic event. This is an example of atrial septal aneurysm in transthoracic echo, and this is how it should be measured. This is another example from transesophageal echo. This is um, uh, almost a bicaval view, and this is how it should be measured. So you measure it from the septal plane, you measure the excursion. More than 10, it's an aneurysm. What about a stachian valve? It's a remnant of the valve of the IVC. You know, um, it should direct the IVC flow direct uh, to the fossa ovalis. If prominent after birth, it will prevent PFO closure. Not only that, it will cause also increase in embolic event. This is an example of a prominent uh, stachian valve. As you can see, you know, this is the IVC. It will direct all IVC blood to the fossa ovalis. So this will prevent uh, uh, closure of uh, the uh, fossa ovalis. Okay, so here you can see, and this is a stachian valve. Sometimes it can be tricky if your gain is too low. So you just increase the gain, and you can see also the stachian valve, how it directs the IVC uh, blood to the fossa ovalis. What about Chiari network? So it's a remnant of the right valve of sinus venosus. It is associated with the presence of PFO and atrial septal aneurysm. So the presence of Chiari network is also important. And not only that, for the closure purpose, it will cause some difficulty for the operator. This is um, an example of atrial septal aneurysm. And if you can look at the right atrium, you will see a chaotic motion, um, which is, um, has uh, two attachments, one to the septum, here and the other attachment somewhere here near the IVC or stachium valve. This is uh, typical of Chiari network. This is again at receptor aneurysm with the presence of Chiari network. So what's the role of echo? First, we need to establish the diagnosis of PFO by establishing right to left shunt, either by color Doppler or uh, mainly agitated saline contrast, and also to guide closure. If we're speaking about transesophageal echo, then you have to sweep in 15 degree increment to make sure that there is uh, no PFO or there is a PFO. And your Doppler scale should be lowered below 40. Okay, so this is an example, and you're looking mainly for this red signal, which is um, right to, uh, to left as a cause of stroke. However, sometimes, you know, if you have an atrial aneurysm or a stretch, we call it stretch PFO when, when uh, the LA or RA is really dilated, you might have a bidirectional or reverse shunt. Uh, agitated saline contrast is very important. Almost you cannot, you know, diagnose without it. 
so either you, you mix 9 ml of saline with 1 ml of air or 8 ml of saline and 1, and 1 ml of blood to make agitation even better and 1 ml of air. You inject rapidly, record for 10 seconds, and if you're doing transesophageal echo, you will find the best image and angle that will show the separation between septum secundum and septum primum, the thin septum which is the primum and the thick septum which is septum secundum. If we are using a um, transthoracic, usually it's the fourth chamber we're looking at. Uh, by definition, uh, if a bubble appears in the left system within three beats after the right atrial opacification, it identifies a PFO. Don't forget to use special maneuver to increase the right atrial pressure, including valsalva maneuver. And the best way to diagnose a PFO is to see the bubble passing between the two septum, even after that, 10 beads. And if you're still not convinced if uh, doing transthoracic, please go ahead and do transesophageal echo. Talking about Valsalva, you need to know that patients who cannot perform Valsalva, they have a high rate of false negative, up to 19% compared with people who can perform adequate Valsalva. They have false negative rate of 9%. So to have an adequate valsalva, we need to have a good straining to start with, but we are interested in the release phase of valsalva once we tell the patient to release. Uh, for the sake of PFO uh, assessment, we are interested in uh, um, making sure that the valsalva is adequate. So the only way to make sure that our maneuver, whether valsalva or other maneuver, is adequate is to see the septum has a leftward shift toward the left side. The rest, you know, are not important in PFO assessment. So what alternative maneuver we have? You can ask the patient to cough spontaneously or you induce cough, or you can do arm raising, leg raising, abdominal compression, especially in transesophageal echo. This is an example of bubble that appears after five beats. However, you can see it passing between the two membranes, the thick membrane and the thin mobile septum primer. Sometimes you have inadequate injections. You should not comment about this. You have to do something else. This is the same patient with adequate uh, injection and good valsalva. And if you know it, it is positive for a PFO. Yes. Again, sometimes you have to really try to do good maneuvers to see the septal shift to the left side. You know, look carefully and you will find that, you know, once we raise the arm and leg and do abdominal compression, you will have this leftward uh, shift of the septum, which is caused by increase of RA uh, pressure. If you cannot perform this, you know, your, your report might be inaccurate. Again, sometimes, you know, and, and if you have a stick and valve and you're really worried it will prevent the, the bubble to be in contact with the fossa ovalis and to perform a good uh, study for PFO. So you might like to do something else. So as we can see here, you know, most of, uh, of the IVC bubble-free blood will be in contact with, uh, with the fossa ovalis. So what, would, what we did here is we injected bubble in the lower limb and here you go. It is a positive for, significantly positive for a PFO. Okay, so now we'll talk about echo roll enclosure. So we have to understand that, you know, the PFO closure device is a two-disc device connected with a thin membrane, usually a, a larger right atrial disc and a smaller left atrial disc connected with a thin membrane. This is the fossa ovalis, and, you know, the blue thing is the septum secundum. It's the thick one. SVC is upward. Uh, IVC is inferior. And this is the septum primum, which is uh, on the left side behind the septum secundum, if you're looking from the RA perspective. Aorta is anterior, and you have here the posterior atrial wall. So the device will be somewhere here between uh, the two membranes. This is where your device will be located, between the septum secundum and septum primum. So you need to make sure that your device is it's big enough to have a good grip of septum secundum and septum primum. However, you, do, you want also to make sure that your device is not, you know, uh, too big to um, uh, prevent or to impinge on, on the SVC or the aorta or the posterior 
uh, membrane. If your device is too small, the PFO closure might not be that adequate. If it's too big, it will uh, interfere with the SVC flow and the aorta. Okay, so how to really do some sizing? It differs. There is no exact guidelines. Some people, they like to do balloon, but the way I like to make it is you need to know two numbers, you know, from device perspective. The radius of the device and the diameter of the device. So the radius of the device, you can see it here in, in the yellow uh, line, should not exceed the distance from the device center where you have here, you know, this is the, the thick uh, septum secundum and this is the thin primum. Your device center will be somewhere here. So the radius should not be more than the distance to the SVC, otherwise it will reach the SVC. Also, the diameter of the device should not be more than the septal length, otherwise it will touch IVC and maybe the posterior wall. But however, the best way to do it, if you have the capability, is to do 3D. If you look here carefully, did you stop playing, but no problem. So this is a thin septum uh, primer, and you see here a drop out, but your device will be somewhere here, here where the star is. So what you need to measure is uh, the distance to SVC, distance of the aorta, and make sure your device will cover this area without uh, impinging on the aorta or reaching the SVC. This is a good size uh, uh, PFO closure device, you see. It covers most of fossa valleys without, you know, reaching the SVC or pressing on the aorta. So the general rule here for PFO uh, device sizing is your device uh, should have a good grip of both septum primum and secundum. Uh, device closure should not impinge the aorta or the posterior wall and should not interfere with the SVC flow. So what about post de deployment after deploying the device and make sure before release you assess the stability of the device, assess interference with the SVC and the aorta. And you know this is not really relevant in PFO closure as compared to ASD closure but also PFO and AV valve function, I mean the atrioventricular valves mitral tricuspid, but actually it's not really relevant here. And of course, after any procedure, look for pericardial effusion. So if you see the image on the left, the device is not really stable, it's not well seated compared to the one after a little bit of maneuvering. It has a good grip of septum secundum and septum primum, so this is a good position of the device and the size is really excellent. This is the same patient you can see. The device has a good grip, it is stable, and it's not impinging in, on the aorta, not interfering with the SVC. AV valve are fun functioning well, you need to put some color to make sure there is no regurgitation. And usually we do transgastric also to make sure there is no any pericardial effusion as a sign of complication. I'm almost done, this is my last slide. Do you know what is this? the circular structure in uh, the left atria. So this is an atrial septal aneurysm. If you look at it from in-phase view, it will look like this. And thank you very much.